Today I'm talking product lines. If, uh, my, my Dutch title was like Baustraat, which is uh, according to the academy I, uh, I was in, translated as a product line. Now you can Google a product line, you won't find as much, but you can Google it. But if you're looking for automation in uh, your delivery, in the delivery of your software, you'll find a lot of articles and posts about continuous integration and continuous <coughs> delivery. And before I start, I'd like to make it clear that these are not the same. You see, continuous integration and continuous delivery are nice processes that you can automate, that you can use in your company, but it's not the same as a product line, and I'm hoping I can make that clear through my talk. And I'm hoping that we can all have something really useful to take back home with us. I don't, um, so another question before I start. I've been using the term weekend warrior in my preparation. So I've got this image that this is this like this this uh, this lone person making like software in their attic. It's becoming a bit more rare than it was like ten years ago. But the weekend warrior term is all is all right. No offense. No offense. All right. Good day. So we got some last coming in. Welcome, welcome. Grab a seat. Grab a seat and stay standing. You stay standing. No. <laughs> Little Dutch humor for you there. All right. About me. So this is me in a nutshell. Um, I tend to run late. And I'm a, I have two children. So that's basically me. I like to crack jokes. I like, I like to uh, take my time for stuff. And a lot of what I do in, in my work comes actually from like my previous career experience. You see, I was like a retail manager before this. Not the most logical of career switch between developer and a retail manager, but I found that a lot of characteristics of a retail manager are like really beneficial when developing software, and especially when organizing everything about software. You see, when, you, when you're a retail manager, you work in a store, you got a bunch of physical products everywhere, and you're just hoping for one thing. You're hoping for the customer, hi, come in, just like a customer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always hoping for the customer that comes in, looks at the products, and already knows, yeah, I want that. Do, would you like some other? No. Would you like another product? No, I just want that. All right, here's a bag of money. Great, right. Would you like some wrappings? No, no wrappers, imagine that. And would you like that? No, all right, next. Ideal customer. Now, this is basically like I have little work to do. Uh, now, I'm a bit of a scatterbrain, so retail management never really took off for me. Uh, the, the helping customers like this was always easy though and it's because I had this character trait that I uh, was, was focusing on, was cherishing and when I noticed that retail management wasn't for me it was exactly this character trait that led me to software development and specifically like one single quote from Bill Gates that most of you will probably know I choose a lazy person to do a hard job because a lazy person will find an easy way to do it well I felt like a real deep connection to this it's like totally me so I thought, figured, you know what? Yeah, let me just learn software development. Let's see how that turns out. Well, here I am today. I'm a software developer now, but you know what? I, <laughs> I, like, to, I like to be lazy, but it's, it, in all seriousness though, I think we all like to create something high quality. We all like to take pride in our work. And in that sense, there's a bit of a, a thing going on called software craftsmanship. It's really, this, this is like a, a bit of an ideal I'd like to aspire to. And I actually have like a friend who's like a real inspiration here. He has his own furniture shop. So taking another detour from software development here. It's a guy who's a carpenter. So he builds furniture. So he basically makes like chairs, seats, sofas, closets, you name it. He makes it from wood. And whatever type of wood he uses, he's got like an entire dictionary of stuff he can use to describe any type of wood. He's got an elk, he talks about the stretchability, maintainability, durability, any, any ility you can find, he knows it. He can talk so much about wood that I joke about his wood on wood, but I'll keep it family friendly for now. Tough crowd. Um, <laughs> so, but he's a, he's a true craftsman. He takes his time for stuff, he just sits down, looks at his wood, carefully selects everything and goes about that. Now, as a software developer, I'd like to be like that. I get like a customer request. I carefully select my tools, my methods, my Drupal modules, everything. I'd like to just select it carefully and then implement that in like the most a beautiful way, in an efficient way, in a smart way. That's how I like to develop my software. 
Now, I started my uh, career like that, with this ideal in mind, just creating quality software. So I was busy making software, making software. I didn't do everything that well, so I tend to rely on a bit of crude methods to get the job done, but sometimes it works. Like one example that I used to really do is like, I, if I wanted to check a variable, I just make like a, an H1 tag on my web page, get, get the variable in there and see if it works. Well, that kind of looks like this, right? Hello, search, and well, obviously my variables aren't showing here. Now, the code behind this I thought was fine, I thought it was great, and at one point I fixed it. So I'm like, yeah, let's get it to the customer as fast as possible. And I did, including this. Ooh. So we had a live site running this, and that made me stop and go like, hmm. I, 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 I think my code is quality, but I don't think anybody would call this quality software. Now, for quality software, that's what we that's why we need product lines, and that's what we're here today for, for product lines. So why do we do this exactly? Well, the goal is always quality software. Quality software, right? So I've already talked about it having to meet quality code, but we also need quality test scripts, right? We, you need that craftsman developer ideal, but you also need him to have like total focus and total commi commitment, and he needs to oversee the entire thing. You shouldn't forget his tests. You shouldn't forget to properly uh, go through a deployment street. You should have a structured pro uh, process. And that is basically what a product line is. It's a process. It's a set of rules, a set of processes, and a set of uh, tools and techniques you use in order to get quality software on quality servers. And this is really, uh, really important. Now, if we're talking about product lines and we're doing today, we're gonna cover some things. We're gonna cover like the basics, like uh, from the introduction just now to like a, basically what, what a product line is supposed to be. We'll go into like a working model, like what we did at Finalist in order to get our product line organized. And then we're going to show just a bit of our tooling to get you up to, uh, to give you a faint idea of how to implement a product line. Now, in order to properly understand the product line, we need to view our company as a garden. This is a particular garden I took in the city of Nara in Japan, because if you want to know about gardening, you go to the Japanese, they know their gardens. What they tend to do is they, they organize all kinds of plants, trees in particular order so that it represents life. And then they make these uh, roads and buildings that are all pretty angular as if to represent the technique of humans in their, angu in their angular shapes and the life of the trees and the life of plants in round shapes and in a bit disorganized fashion. Now, the funny thing about this, uh, about this analogy is that if you think of any process running in your company, whether that's like getting your testers, uh, the way you organize your DTAP configuration, you, you can see those processes kind of like the plants in a garden. Because, you know, if you just plant something somewhere and you leave it alone for a, lot of, uh, for a long time, it tends to sprout like weeds, little plants you don't want in your garden. Now, there's a really pl practical ex example of that. Normally, when you've got like a process going, you'd like your customer to pay you for your work. This is like natural. So your manager tends to ask you like, all right, how much time did you spend on working on a certain issue? Well, you never know by heart, so you've got some tools installed and there are all kinds of little processes going around in that tool, like get your hours in before the end of the week, get your hours in for the end of the month. It's a weed. It's a process nobody wants. You just like to grab it out, toss it. It's like, it's very existence just seems to annoy you. That's what like our registration is. And that's what little side processes in a, gar uh, in a garden can be. So a product line for our intent is meant to organize the trees in a, in, a, in a fashion so we can accurately see the trees, see the shrubberies and notice which are weeds so we can pull them out. So we can make our process as efficient and quick and easy as possible. So that's why the garden analogy works. Now we can just jump in, but we tend to take baby steps. Now, this is my son. I always take like every opportunity I can to boast because I'm a dad and I'm just like that. But my son, he's, he's, a, bit, he's a bit like me. Um, he likes to get things done now, not yesterday. So when, when he was like, at one point I thought, all right, you can crawl now, right? So I put him on the floor. He put his, like, his little arms before him and he just shoved himself backwards. 
<laughs> and he was like, I want to go forward. But no, he just keeps shoving himself backwards. It was hilarious, actually. But he just got like... <laughs> and, but he was annoyed. He was like, I want to go forward. I know I want to go forward, but I'm not getting there. So he just quit. He said, this isn't working for me. Just, I, I quit. I'm not moving anywhere. You're, you're carrying me anyway, so whatever. So at one point I was like, come on, I'll show you how to walk. So I grabbed his hands and we took like the baby steps. And now he's like, oh, does that work? So anytime he wants to go somewhere, he just goes like, grab, tries to find my fingers. And what, no matter how, what I, how I try to steer him, he just grabs my fingers. All right, now we're walking. Well, that's great. But he's not actually walking by himself. I couldn't, I, you couldn't run. I can't run with him like this. So he'll never be able to run if he sticks with this. And when designing a product line, this is important to realize. We, we, because we all tend to be like that. We've got some kind of tool or we've got some kind of process that helps us walk, and, that's, and we tend to stick with that. It's like, all right, this works, I'm fine now. You'll never be able to run. Yeah, of course I can. You just run, the tool just has to run with me. Doesn't work like that. You have to take every step. You have to crawl first, get, get across the sofa first, then you can walk, then you can run. So taking that in mind that we're going step by step, I might go a bit slow into getting to the product line, but it's because of this, because we need to take the baby steps. Speaking of baby steps, if we go into the product line, uh, just to go into like examples, we first need to figure out, all right, what are we organizing exactly? What are the product processes we're talking about? And that's basically this. I uh, boil, boil it down to like four basic areas. And what you can see like with these areas, you've got like intake, which is where you uh, listen to your customer and you get some kind of requests, whether that's an initial project or just a request for change or maybe some bug. You, you, they, these land in intake and you'll notice that a lot of proce processes just naturally form around intake whether that's like an issue management system your help desk anything that you use to communicate your customer or like the plants in your garden that form around the intake part next up we have development which i think i don't need to explain as much you've got your editors you've got you've got your like your git and and all kinds of tools you use for development Delivery, you've got your DTAP configuration, you've got your environments, maybe you've, you've scripted it uh, in, a, in a certain fashion. And after that, you've got transaction, right? You, uh, you have your customer, so you've got like some kind of invoice system, the dreaded hour management system I, noticed, uh, I noted earlier. These are the things that all come across in any company, right? I think, at least I think so. But this is how, what I distilled it to. This is where the processes were going. Now, if you think about your own company, how you fix this, you might have like just, you, you might be a weekend warrior and you might just figure this out on your own and have like really easy processes. But if you're a bit of a bigger company, you tend to have like larger processes. For us personally, we just figured, all right, let's make a diagram. We'll just take out all of the elements that come across in these uh, circles and we'll make a diagram out of it. And it looks like this. Now, it's not really readable, I think. Uh, at least it doesn't have to be, because you can, you can ask me later if you'd like to learn more about how we actually implemented it. But just a couple of things to note here is that it all, it's circular almost, so it comes back in, uh, to the beginning. And every step of the way has been a thought process, because this is the final product of like 10, 10 20 iterations just for getting the status quo. And most of them just were way bigger. So I've actually made it smaller by thinking about it. And why this is beneficial and why this is a baby step you should take is because like in any time you're going to draw this diagram, you're going to come across some things that won't make sense to you. Let's have an example for that. So here we have, we're, we, we're just coming from the fact that a customer has Request has for, has finalized their request, right? So everything they want is now smartly formulated. It's now manageable. There's some kind of agreement on how many hours you'll spend on it. We've got an issue, and it and there we go. So we start off with a developer writing code, and I just made the text bigger to make it more readable on the screen. And you've got the check-in, and we've got some code tests. Now this seems like really large, really logical order. It's like you see it, it's like, all right, fine. But think, just think for about for a second. We've got code tests. Think code sniffer. Think um, syntax checks. I've noted here that it's after checking the coding with Git in our case. Do you? Or because at this point, that means that your Git will, will possibly contain faulty code. So 
maybe this doesn't make sense. On the other hand, we personally work with peer reviews. And in order for peer reviews to work, you have to make a basic assumption. So for us, we said, all right, if we want a peer review, then the peer reviewer should ideally make sure that the code checkers have been run. But in order to run his own code checkers on it, the code has to be checked in. So this is an entire thought process on just two bubbles here. And it, what, what I like about this end result that we've got here is that the moment code is checked in, we're not just going to assume this is quality code. We're going to check it, and checking is knowing. You have to, we always check in this, in this scenario, just because I just put it in a bunch of bubbles. Th those are some nice bubbles. Another example, we've got a production procedure here. So because of the way the diagram flows, we're actually reading in reverse, right? It's um, right to left, mirroring, very difficult. So we are, we have, I, I'm saying like we've got a product release, then we've got some kind of confirmation that the product release has actually happened, where it depends on your tool or whether you're just doing it yourself, whether you've done all the steps, there's some kind of confirmation process. At this point, and at the confirmation product, you'll notice whether it has been successful or not. Now, that little yellow node dictates that decision, the decision making, right? Is this a successful production release? If it's not, I've written it, and you can read it below, it's that it's a manual review, not a tooling review. Now, this actually led to some discussion in-house when we, uh, when we uh, made that choice. It's like, all right, if it's a manual review, then you can't use code, you can't use tools, you can't use all kinds of things that you'd ideally use to, to like check if everything went correctly. Well, it's right, but you don't always control your production environment. So what we'd like to have is a process that is generic for any situation. And if we're writing a generic situation, then you cannot rely on a server that you don't always have full control over. So a whole lot of discussion, one, one bubble, again. So the last bits are a bit more easier to understand, like the customer in the, uh, go, goes, to, goes to look for himself, which is noted, but uh, won't be an eye-opener for many of you. And then the customer can say, all right, this is faulty. And we've made the conscious decision to, in, in case of either a, a bad review or a bad customer acceptance, to actually roll back. You don't have to, but if we take that as a standard, you don't have to think about it this mu that much. All right, so now we've got a fancy diagram. And a fancy diagram is fancy. It's, it, it's, it's detailed, it's big, and I know that some of you more practical-minded, at least that's what I would think in your, in your position. It's like, all right, theory, awesome, great. Um, how does this help me exactly? Because we can agree in, uh, because we can agree on everything. Well, this is where like your actual tooling comes into play. So let's talk a bit more practical now. Now, for our tooling, we've got like Jenkins. Now, Jenkins probably needs a bit of explanation because I'm in like PHP world here, and this is a this was initially built for Java application. I know cursing, but never never mind that for now. Jenkins. Jenkins is an automation tool. It's actually a build tool, which with Drupal 8 and Composer becomes increasingly important to have uh, proper build procedures. But for those who don't know, it's basically just make sure that all the terminal commands, all the bash commands that you need to get your software ready for a server done in a sequential order, right? You automate it. And Jenkins does that, it's a build tool. But now we had already had Jenkins because at our company, we also do a lot of Java applications. So it's not that this is like the holy grail of build tools for Drupal, but it will, but its actual benefits will become apparent. You see, when designing a, uh, when, when implementing Jenkins, you're basically organizing a whole bunch of bash commands. And what Jenkins does since like half a year or something is dictate that this should be done with what they call a declarative pipeline. So here we actually have some code. I know you, uh, I know. sorry, kept you waiting. What we have here is what they call a Jenkins file, or a declarative pipeline. What we see here is that in JSON-like format, or actually it's groovy, uh, sorry, can't help it, is that it orchestrates all of the necessary steps that you do in order to get like uh, your code from local development to a production. It's all the steps written in code, and you, we put this in the, source for, uh, in the source repository. Now you can reuse this for any project you run, but since we were working off of a generic diagram, we can also have a generic declarative pipeline working everywhere. And this is, this is 
instantly reusable and since we've already had the thought process of the diagram this is pretty easy to write because you just follow the little bubbles you made i love bubbles they're easy now one of the things that jenkins does is again since that half a year is that they completely reinvented their ui with what they call blue ocean and you can see it in the top let me just i know i shouldn't turn my back but i would just want to see if it's a bit readable not really so what you, if, you look, if you squint, you can see that it has these little, little circles on top. These are the nodes we saw in the declarative pipeline just visualized. And what it does, because we've had the diagram, we can easily cross-reference cross if our agreements and our ideas that we've thought of before are actually <coughs> implemented in a generic way. So what we personally did is we took our thoughts and ideas that we discussed at length about deployment and delivery, and we made it simple to understand into these nodes, and it all works fine. So I'm just gonna skip a bit because of the time, but what we love, what I love about this is that this, what we did extra is that in that declarative pipeline, organizing these nodes, is that we made sure that we're calling local scripts to actually do the heavy lifting. So we've got like for our, Testing, we've got test scripts in source, in the, rep in the code repository, and we make sure that all Jenkins does is say, hey, run scripts from your test environment test folder, or run deployment from your test environment deployment folder. Since it's just bash, you can, you can write sh files, and it, Jenkins does that because it runs on Linux, and it just can run anything that you know, Linux basically can. So by keeping your, co your, your delivery logic and your testing logic in your source repository, you've got all the project related items in your code and all of the delivery related base work in Jenkins, which is a nice separation of concerns. Bonus points for Jenkins specifically is that if you run tests, it nicely displays your test results in nice diagrams, which if you're looking for a different tool, is very, uh, can, uh, this should be highly on your list, whether you test the results. You don't want any debug statements on live sites. So, what we see now is that in order to have like craftsmanship, to have quality code, you need to organize your processes so that you can see the little nodes in Blue Ocean or you can see your nodes in your, in your pipeline script that say, hey, this is, a, this is a meaningless process. Now, if you design a garden, you can uh, just figure out how you want stuff to be made. You can put that in a diagram, which is the important baby step because we tend to skip that we tend to skip making diagrams, just get right on the money. No, trust me, don't do that. Make a diagram because you'll notice that a lot of discussion is born out of that. And once you have a proper diagram, you can act actually and act effectively manage making your tool work for you. This is super beneficial in, in using the Adage, don't repeat yourself, because once, think once, write once, use forever. And that's it for, and that's it for my talk. I have four more. I have four minutes for questions. <coughs> no questions. Ah, oh, that that's great. <laughs> hope I hope you forgive my accent. Now let me and uh, thank you for your time. <laughs>